The Mary River flows from the hills and forests of the Conondale and Blackall Ranges in the Sunshine Coast hinterland, through fertile farmland, through towns and cities like Gympie and Meriburra, to finally meet the sea in the Great Sandy Strait. Its catchment covers some 9,600 square kilometres and is made up of a number of subcatchments, which together include over 3,000 kilometres of streams and tributaries. Some 200,000 people live in the catchment, and many outside it directly benefit from Mary River water. We share our dependence on the river with many species of plants and animals, some of which are endangered and threatened. The Mary River turtle, the Mary River cod, and the prehistoric Australian lungfish are among the best known. All of which depend on a healthy catchment for their survival. Many agricultural industries benefit from the rich alluvial floodplains deposited by the river over millennia and rely too on water from both the river and groundwater to irrigate pasture for dairy cattle, provide stock water and to irrigate crops. The Mary is also integral to the ecosystem of the Great Sandy Strait, supporting migratory birds, dolphins and dugongs, as well as triggering breeding and providing the habitat needed for the commercial and recreational fish stocks to flourish. Aboriginal people lived carefully with the river for thousands of years, but the last 170 years of white settlement have resulted in major changes in both the catchment and in many of its waterways. Awareness of these impacts and how we can better work with and live with the river has been growing in recent decades. Come with us on a journey through some of this history, offering a glimpse of the way in which this special river has always been a part of our lives. A long, long time ago, Australia was part of a large landmass called Gondwana land, and that was about 370 million years ago. At that time, the Australian plate collided with the oceanic plate and subducted, went down beneath the Australian crustal plate, which gave a volcanic chain of mountains all along the east coast of what we now recognise as Australia. And this is the forerunner of the Great Dividing Range that we see today. The actual creation of the catchments and landscape we tend to see today is a very recent phenomenon, mostly around about two million years ago. And that's where you have erosion carving the landscape, finding the weak rocks, finding the weak points, and carving what we see today as catchments. We started off today talking about 370 million years ago. Indigenous people were known to be in this area perhaps 40 to 50,000 years ago and walked the earth at that time. It's a very interesting fact that when you look at European settlement, we're talking more of two to 300 years. It's hard to understand 50,000 years that the indigenous people were here, let alone 200 million years when the dinosaurs were around, or when Australia was part of a massive landmass called Gondwana land. This map is one a lesson from Arnie Olgamilla, and it was in around 1993. The lesson was here at my place in, in the house and this is how Auntie did the lesson. She went back to pre-contact times on 
how the tribes were situated um, in the area, but not only in this area, the tribes that affected the Mooloola people and the Bachelor people. What was originally called the Bunya Bunya lands or the Bunya mountains uh, was the area what we now call the Blackall Ranges around Mullaney and Montville. And um, that's you know, Petrie, Simpson, all the early um, Leichhardt, all the, all the first references we have when they talk about it, they, they, um, you, you can tell by the maps and where they've gone, that was where they were going. The, the coastal area of the Bunyas and Black Hole Ranges, it, it was known as Baroon, and there's still, that still survives, and you've got Lake Baroon, which is sort of on top of Baroon Pocket, which was a, a little uh, twist, I suppose, in the, um, in the Obi Obi Creek. It, it was dammed in the 1980s. But before that, it was a, like a secluded valley. It was a gorge with a, a woodland plain. So there was, there was certainly a huge quantity of people came there every every so often and stayed for anything from two months to half a year. You know. it, it seems like the, 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 the people who coordinated the, the Bunya Festival, which would be the, the, the traditional custodians of that area, uh, they coordinated this through a whole lot of smoke signals So because the, the descriptions are that everybody turned up there simultaneously and this was done through this. And before, just before that they actually would burn off all the land so that to actually open the, the bunya season they'd actually burn off the whole country around there and that was supposed to be the sign and also kind of um, to prepare the, the, the land and this had been done months beforehand. So it was like the culmination for this whole area of like South East Queensland, North New South Wales of of everything from ceremonial life to social life and political stuff. Any issues that you had that were beyond your group, you know, that was sort of for the whole area. Outside of the daily uh, event of being there, there would be things like the, the, the parliament. And Petrie describes it, a, a very large circle was made in the earth and, and the elders would, from different groups would actually sit around that. The younger men were, uh, could sort of stand around if they want, but they weren't allowed to say anything. And the, and the elders would get up one in after another, you know, uh, and sort of share the news of their country or issues. And so there would be sort of like a, what we'd call a round table discussion. They said it was very much like a um, parliament in the, in the Western system. And, and so things would get decided. This area is a significant area because this is the area where the Butchler people crossed over to Waka Waka country. And so we're at the, um, the Ura here, which is the Butchler word for gateway. And so our mob walked through here over into Waka Waka land and met up with the Waka Wakas on their way to the Bunya Mountains for the Bunya Festival. And this happened every few years. And the last time it happened where the Butchlers were here on this site was in 1843. From then on, it, the land was developed with settlers and sheep and cattle and horses. So, and this is the way the Butchlers came back to from the Bunya Mountains. So they used the Mary River, or Moonaboola as we know it, and they crossed over from Gary, from Fraser Island, over to south of Riverheads, and um, came down the Mary River that way in their canoes to here and this was uh, an event that happened when the cicadas hatched out in the ground then they would begin their long walk up to the festival. And many times I looked down there and I looked here at afternoon looking for that Munagari down there. I know he's down there still. I can see that water there has been made green. And people might say to me, what's the Mundungari or what's the Janjari? 
Tall man lives in here too. The Yowie lives in here. We know he's in here. So you see there's a lot of these big mussel shells here at this point in time. See this one. Now I asked you before, did you ever eat this one? Well this one running in fresh water and clean water is pretty good to eat. But if it's running in dirty water, you might have to uh, soak it in fresh water for a few days to take that muddy taste out of it. But I ate this one here as a boy and you'd make a little uh, little spoon out of it. You see, once upon a time when Aboriginal people were here, they had no spoons. But you see how this could be made into a little spoon, a little digger, and uh, when it's nice and big and fat like that, you just put it beside the fire like that. And then when it, when it opens up, it's ready to eat. In the background here, we have the uh, men's business, which is called the pocket area. Uh, this area was for mainly for the men there, and uh, they had their corroborees around this area. In the, uh, this way around, all around in here, somewhere in there, uh, they would have their meeting places there from all the other Aboriginal uh, men that came from all over the areas there, out west and down south and north and that there, the Cubby Cubby, the Waka Waka and the Garang Garang. Uh, it's an area there where um, uh, it was a secret men's business and no women were allowed there. If any women did come in around that area they were instantly uh, killed. Um, as you see in this area here, basically would have been a lot of scrubby area and it was a very good safe area for them there. The river goes right round further uh, into a U shape, so that area was pretty well guarded there. The Mitch and Berries were on, and one young boy forgot the rule of looking out for the snakes underneath the bushes and he was bitten and he died and the elders tried to revive him and in the ceremony the clever man was doing his bit calling up the spirit to come back into the little boy's body when Davis appeared from behind the bushes and the young people of the bachelors said Durham boy, Durham boy, which is the bachelor word for look, look. And the clever man and the elders thought that was the white spirit that had come back to go into the boy's body. The chap that had uh, been on that particular uh, expedition uh, had come up with Petrie and uh, some others. They left Brisbane by whale boat and uh, came up and stopped at Noosa and picked up uh, one of the escaped convicts there. By this time um, in uh, 1842, the penal station in Brisbane had ceased and they were able to uh, tell him that he'd probably get ticket of leave if he decided to come with them and guide them up further up the coast. His name was Bracewell, David Bracewell, but he had the Aboriginal name of Wandai. So Wandai went with them and uh, took them into Wide Bay, which Cook had named when he came up the coast, uh, across the bar into the Great Sandy Straits, then negotiated the straits up as far as the mouth of the Mary River, and uh, then up the Mary River they uh, negotiated the river as far as Tyro, uh, just to the south of Tyro, uh, just to the north of Tyro, I'm sorry, 
and uh, there is a place there called Petrie Park which commemorates Petrie's uh, expedition to that particular place. That was about the end of the navigation as far as the whale boat was concerned. And um, when they got there though, uh, there was a gathering of about 400 chiefs and warriors and they weren't very happy. Because uh, what had happened at Kilcoy Station down on the Stanley, uh, allegedly there had been poisoning of uh, about 50 or 60 Kabi Kabi people. Uh, that eventuated through flour laced with arsenic. And um, it traveled, the word traveled quickly on the Aboriginal Telegraph. They held this meeting and not surprisingly the meeting came up were as uh, revenge. The Petrie party arrived at the same time as the meeting was breaking up and um, they were just lucky that uh, the escaped convict James Davis, who had the uh, Aboriginal name of Duramboy, uh, was with the party. Uh, he presented to the Petrie party barefoot, naked, same as his Aboriginal friends, uh, probably a little lighter in colour. Uh, but he, um, after hearing their story of Petrie and co and what they were doing here and the fact that he might be repatriated and uh, receive ticket of leave if he went back with them, he argued for their, um, for their rescue, that they, they weren't to be killed. Uh, he had to argue forcefully in order to do that. Uh, but he was re pretty respected amongst the Aboriginals. He'd lived with them for 14 years in the Mount Scotchy area. Uh, just to the north of Gympie, on the Mary River. And um, so the Petrie party um, were saved from a demise that um, might have put them down in, in uh, rather um, different terms to what they became as pretty established and, and uh, well-recognised um, early settlers in uh, the Brisbane region. It's very unusual because, as far as I know, it's the only part in Australia where, where that whole area was proclaimed um, uh, sacrosanct, if you liked. And, and the, the, the accounts I've read in the newspapers of the sort of arguments going back and forward at this time, they were comparing it to some to different holy plants in the, in the, in the, in the Holy Land. And you know, they, they said, oh, it's like manna from heaven and so on, which they were using biblical kind of talk. And um, Petrie, who was one of the first, his father had been there in 1836 and then he himself in 1846. Uh, anyway, the, the Petrie family, they, they were involved in asking um, uh, Governor Gibbs, who was the governor of the whole New South Wales colony, of which Queensland was part back then, uh, to protect it. And, and so in 1842, the governor made this proclamation. It has been presented to the governor that a district exists to the northward of Moreton Bay, in which a fruit-bearing tree, fruit bearing tree abounds, called the Bunya, or Bunya Bunya, and that the Aborigines from considerable distances resort at certain times of the year to this district for the purpose of eating the fruit of the said tree. His Excellency is pleased to direct that no licenses be granted for the occupation of any lands within the said district in which the Bunya or Bunya Bunya tree is found. And notice is hereby given that several Crown Commissioners in the New England and Moreton Bay districts have been instructed to remove any persons who may be in unauthorised occupation of land upon the said Bunya or Bunya Bunya trees area. His Excellency has also de declared that no licences to cut timber be granted within the said district. Now that, that is extraordinary because that actually meant that a huge chunk of what's now Queensland couldn't be touched because wherever a bunya bunya tree is growing then you know you couldn't um, uh, you, you won't let it live but it... Simpson was liked on both sides of the fence uh, and uh, he was um, the Aboriginals thought he was uh, a very fair and just man and uh, so did the, the whites of uh, the Brisbane area thought he was uh, very fair. Um, he, he had a very 
unfortunate association. When he first came out here to Australia, he just married, oh, back in England, he just married his cousin. He'd been engaged to her for 20 years. That was how it was in those days, and quite a lot of them. Uh, I suppose you get to know people in 20 years. <laughs> uh, but, um, and uh, she died, I think it was in childbirth, just after she arrived here. So he put in for, for, uh, for Morton Bay and came up here. And uh, he was administrator until... Uh, um, and then he was uh, a medical uh, superintendent up here for um, some time. And then he became the Crown Lands Commissioner. And uh, his journey up into the Mary Valley was to uh, firstly see the Mary Valley and see what it was uh, like for settlement. Uh, and to uh, also look for a division between Wide Bay and Morton Bay so that they could conduct, uh, create another uh, land district up in that area, which would be governed from the Wide Bay area, uh, once it became settled. So this was way back in 1842, 1843 actually, that he came through. And um, he brought with him a uh, Presbyterian uh, minister from the, from the um, uh, German mission station at uh, Nunda. And um, the reason for, his name was Ipa, and the reason for Ipa coming along was because Gipps, the Governor Gipps had criticised them for not being able to convert the Australian Aboriginals into uh, Christianity in the Moreton Bay area. And he said, you need to get out amongst the, the, uh, the areas. And uh, I don't know what was going to happen about then converting the Aboriginals to Christianity in the Moreton Bay area. But anyway, he came on the trip uh, but um, he didn't have much success with the Aboriginals he did talk to. And um, it was settled in 1847 and uh, the river going up to that, that stretch of the river was always a problem for ships. Lots of sandbars and shallows and as the ships got bigger and heavier uh, didn't help matters and they tended to get held up for days at a time on the um, on the shallows and the sandbars and it got to the stage where uh, at one point there the ships had uh, difficulty even accessing the area so they had to relocate the port and the site that was picked was the uh, stretch of the river uh, where port site is today from the Brolga Theatre right down past the Granville Bridge and in those days, there was over a mile and a half of wharves in its heyday. And by about 1855, 56, the town had relocated to the present site and just grew from there. Where the Granville Bridge is, uh, there were wharves down past the bridge and the um, ships had to access those wharves. And in those days, the Granville Bridge was a bascule bridge and it would open up to allow our ships access to the wharves further down. On the Ulster Bay maps, it's, it's written on there, um, 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 lightly timbered, scattered, scattered clumps of you know bloodwood, ironbarks, whatever else. And the way it reads, you could you could get all the way between some of these bigger trees. And whether it was because of a lot of fires back then, and mm -hmm. the Aboriginals might have opened the country up with fires and that. But as soon as they started stocking the land, the, the country sort of seemed to grow shut because there was a lot of regrowth and that. With it, you know, and it sort of drew the country shut. So that's when they started. Um, thinning it out, I suppose, ring barking and that, and see, like we said, the, with the closer settlement the policies, when you selected a block, you had to do so much improvements a year. Well, I suppose the easiest way to improve was to grab the axe and line in the back of the shed and chop a few trees down to show that you're improving it. So mm -hmm. it was sort of the governments encouraged you to, to sort of clear the land and prepare it. Because, mm -hmm. see, the bigger pastoral holdings just run cattle and, you know, they might have run. 600 head on 30,000 acres, whereas when the closer settlements, they had to try to run more cows on a smaller area, so they had to try to develop it, didn't they? The Native Police was a military force that operated on the Queensland frontier from 1849 through till about World War One, 
and it consisted of Aboriginal troopers led by European officers and the sole purpose of the native police was to kill Aboriginal people and crush any Aboriginal resistance to European colonisation. They were given a very clear choice. You can either join the native police or you can be shot by them. And most people would rather join than be shot. So there, there really, there was no such thing as free will. It wasn't by their own choice. These were young men who were watching a society in chaos, a society, a community that had degenerated as a result of European colonisation. And this was their one and only chance to be men again. As far as they could see, they had very few choices. They could either go down the road of, of disappearing, becoming irrelevant, or else they could take on this role and for once in their lives walk tall as men. In 1859, the colony of Queensland came into being um, and uh, one of the first acts that came out in 1860 was called the uh, Unoccupied Crown Lands Occupation Act and the title really speaks for itself. It was uh, actually uh, Governor Burke in 1835 who declared that Australia was occupied under terra nullius. Um, before that it had sort of um, been rumbling along as to how the, uh, the, the British had um, declared possession of, um, of Australia and uh, it was Burke's proclamation that, of 1835 that said it had been declared under terra nullius and that, there were n that nobody owned the land before the British came. Uh, that was probably at the back of the legislation of the uh, Occupation Act that came out in 1860, where uh, the government under those proclamation from Governor Burke could uh, declare that nobody owned the land beforehand and therefore that um, the uh, proclamation by uh, Governor Gipps that it be a reserve for the Aboriginals was not relevant and uh, it sealed the fate of the Bunyapine in a lot of areas. And of course the traditional expedition to the Bunya festivals every few years that the Aboriginals made. There is some really um, graphic, horrific accounts of native police violence on the Mary River, particularly in Maryborough itself. And one of the records that I have got here, a copy, is from 1860. And it's when the native police pursued Aboriginal people through the streets of Maribara, chased them into the river. And when these Aboriginal people tried to swim across the river, the native police got boats and followed them and shot them in the water. And the amazing thing about that episode is that there were European witnesses who testified in court that they had seen the native police killing. The native police actually used the, the standard defence. They said they were just doing their job. And they claimed that those Aboriginal people were criminals, therefore they were quite entitled to shoot them. Initially, the first troopers for the native police were all recruited in southern New South Wales and Victoria and then brought up, particularly to the Darling Downs, but also to the Mary. And certainly in the early years, the troopers were from a long way away. And they were also spending a lot of their time trying to recruit Aboriginal men to join. And there is actually a newspaper story of uh, one of the troopers going there and he's saying to the young men, come and join the native police, we'll give you a uniform, a gun, a horse, you'll be a big man. We 
We were a big immigration port in the early days. We had 22,000 overseas immigrants land where uh, Portside is today. And in those days, we were second to Sydney on the Eastern Seaboard for immigration. The first ship to come direct with immigrants was the Ariadne, and it, re it um, came in 1862. Prior to that, uh, immigrants were coming into Brisbane and they were trickling up to the area on the coastal ships and they would come up into the port on the coastal ships. And in those days, Marlborough was a, a relatively young town and um, first port settled north of Brisbane and uh, being a new town, they wanted people, they wanted industry, they wanted agriculture, anything that would grow the town. And the government of the day at the time had agents overseas in England um, recruiting uh, suitable people and um, the people they were looking for were tradesmen, farmers, those type of uh, people and um, there are all types of people came, families, single, uh, married couples, all sorts came to the area and there's descendants of a lot of those still around today. Just over 12,000 um, South Sea Island people, Kanakas they were called, Kanaka means man, and uh, in those days, in some instances, it was virtually kidnapping, they called it blackbirding, and um, at the time they weren't treated very well, uh, particularly on the bigger plantations, some of the overseers were quite, uh, quite severe, and um, in those days they... Um, they came from several islands. The most uh, prominent ones were New Caledonia, Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands. Some of the islands, when they, got, they were known uh, that this sort of thing was happening, uh, a lot of the um, islands would uh, rebel a bit and there was instances where um, ships' crews were killed or massacred and the ships were damaged. Um, to prevent them taking the people from the islands. There's quite a few entrances of that. Um, Taggart was noted in his, um, some of the records we have here, that he was supposed to have found gold out on his property, which is out on the northern aspect of the township. And, uh, but the main strike here was just prior to the, the rush in Gympie with Nash in 1868. Uh, in that early 1868, there was a, te a tent city out on the uh, area near the local cemetery and there was uh, supposedly over a thousand people at some stage. They had hotels and the stores and oh, I suppose they had the official offices where the, the, the miners could take their gold and all that type of thing, you know. So. So that um, when the strike actually came, people came from all directions. Uh, people who were shepherds and ringers and that on the cattle stations or the sheep stations just left their employ and headed for the big money at, at Gympie Creek. And um, so the tracks came from the north, from Maryborough, from uh, Kilkeven area and uh, Nanango and those places, and from the east even, uh, from um, uh, Lake Catharabar and those places where there was some activity, uh, but mainly from the south. And uh, that was firstly over the Conondale. But uh, soon after the strike um, uh, came, uh, they decided that a new road was needed between Gympie and Brisbane. There's a, the Old Bumper Cattle Station that we're talking about, they took up 50 acres and mm -hmm. then they took up 50 square miles of pasture lease. Mm -hmm. Well, he employed um, 21 men mm -hmm. on that mm -hmm. at that mm -hmm. time. That was back in the 1870s. He employed 21 people to help him yeah. run it. Yeah. And there's 650 head of cattle, I think it said the pasture lease run. Yeah. But see, I suppose wages were nothing. And, In uh, the 1880s, the Government of Queensland passed a Land Act 
that enabled them to uh, break up those big runs because they were leased properties and they were leased from originally the New South Wales government. And it was £10 a year. They paid for lease for these thousands and thousands of acres. And those properties were not terribly productive in as much as producing foodstuffs for the emerging state of Queensland. So the government brought in this act enabling smaller selectors to select parts of this land on a lease basis for five years. Uh, and the lease was worked out on the quality of the land. So the better, the more fertile land, they were charged more, up to two and sixpence an acre. On the less fertile land, the hill country, which was considered not very good for uh, cropping, uh, it was down to about one and threepence an acre. When, when they started splitting up the big pasture holdings, he come, apparently he came out from England under, um, um, oh, what do you call it? Under, not under charge, but uh, under the handling of Elworthy and Miller, which was a big pastoral company based in England. And they had some country around, uh, pastoral leases around, and they couldn't take up any more. So he selected a block of land, and in five years time after he selected it, he gave it to Elworthy and Miller. And then he went over and selected another block himself. But yeah, he's, yeah, that was in the 18, what did it say, 18, yeah, no, 87 or something? 87, yeah. yeah. But you know, it was the Maitlands and, and um, Dorans and all, and a lot of, a lot of families all sort of come in. It must have been around the time when the pastoral holdings were all getting split up into smaller, mm. smaller slabs, yeah. So in the 1890s, uh, early 1890s, uh, a group of young men from uh, what was known as Upper Kedron, uh, they travelled right through to Gympie looking for land um, and they found land that they liked and that they could afford because they weren't coming from a wealthy background here at what was then known as Yahoo Creek. It's now known as Jurala. Under the terms of the lease, each of their uh, properties, they had to clear a certain percentage of the land, they had to fence a certain percentage of the land, they had to build a shelter, and they had to show evidence of having grown crops. Now this applied to each and every one of their three properties that they took up. So they worked them cooperatively, remembering that these properties were very heavily timbered so there was a lot of clearing with axe and saw, all hand equipment, and they worked to, to get them to a level that was required by the government inspectors. Now, if they didn't meet the criteria in the lease, they forfeited that land and, and all the work that, they, that went into it. So it was quite a battle uh, for them to, to keep up and to keep the payments up. Uh, so they came up here to grow these small crops because they had a ready market in the Gympie goldfields. It was a three-day round trip to, uh, to Gympie, but excess crops would be picked and taken to Gympie and sold to uh, the miners. 1893, there was a major flood right across southeast Queensland. Uh, all their fertile land was riverbank land, river flats. So uh, their crops were wiped out. The Mary River and Gympie's Gold are both a result of the local geology. And without the Mary, there wouldn't have been the adequate supply of water required for the mining and the township. In 1870, the first flood of over 21 metres hit and it came as quite a surprise and flooded many of the mines and washed away quite a few houses. As mining went on and the shafts got deeper, ventilation became a problem. So 
they would put an air shaft, an air course between the shafts to provide better ventilation and emergency egress. This system was useful until water went down the shafts because if it went down one shaft, it would then flood them all. So the drainage board was created and their job was to install floodgates to prevent the water from entering the shafts. By 1893, they thought they had it pretty well sorted out. But the 1893 flood of over 25 metres went over shafts that they didn't expect to be flooded and water entered the shafts, went down the shafts, and of course this compressed the air in the shaft below the floodgates. The pressure built up to such an extent that the floodgates were blown off many of the shafts, destroying the poppet heads above them. This meant that a lot of the mines were out of action for months doing repairs and bailing out the water. The timber from Fraser Island came via log barge up to Mariborough. It was about four or five barges in my day. The, I think it was the Guri, the, the Kagari, the Pelican, the Lasso Gary, something else, not sure what it was. There was about four or five running. And they gradually dwindled away. Most of them were out on the artificial reef at the moment. Now, probably stay there for a bit longer still. <coughs> but prior to that, when Pettigrew and Sim had the biggest sawmill in Queensland on the river, their timber was rafted up from Tin Can Bay, towed up in big rafts by the Tug Hercules from Tin Can Bay, so that was a different method altogether. It was not far down from Maribor, about 8 miles, 13 k's down from Maribor at Dundatha, the largest pine sawmill in Queensland it was in its day, so that was pretty big time. Built in 63, 1863. Flooded in the big 1893 flood, we haven't mentioned that yet, that was the biggest one in white man's time, just destroyed the mill, wrecked the equipment. They re-equipped again, got brand new stuff from Scotland in 1893. Christmas day of that year, the mill burnt down. That was the end of it, it was never rebuilt. So it lasted 30 years, but in its heyday it was pretty big time. I've got a picture of about five Schooners pulled up at the wharf loading timber, so it was big time. <laughs>